But today in particular, we're going to be talking about the faithfulness of God, which I would say is one of the most important characteristics of God. Of course, all of God's characteristics are important because they make up who he is. But I honest to God think that this is one of the most important ones that we should remember, that we should believe and accept because it really, really, really affects how we view God as a whole. So there's one really big, important and powerful statement that I hope by the end of the sermon, every last one of us can like really understand. It's very simple, but it's very powerful. And it's this. It's God is faithful. And let's see what the scriptures actually have to say about the faithfulness of God and God being faithful. It tells us in Hebrews 10, 22 through 23, it tells us, let's approach God with sincere heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let's hold firmly to the confession of our hope without wavering for he who promised is faithful. He naturally, of course, being God. 1 Thessalonians 5, 23-24 tells us this, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely, and may your spirit and soul and body be kept complete without blame at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he who calls you, and he also will do it. 1 John 1, 9, for some of us is a very familiar verse. It says this, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous or just, so that he will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And Psalms 33, 1 through 4 tells us this as well. Sing for joy in the Lord, you righteous ones. Praise is becoming to the upright. Give thanks to the Lord with the lyre. Sing praises to him with the harp of ten strings. Sing to him a new song. Play skillfully with a shout of joy. For the word of the Lord is right, and all his work is done in faithfulness. And God actually says this about himself to Moses while they're on Mount Sinai. In Exodus 34, 6 through 7, he says this. Then the Lord passed by in front of him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, compassionate and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in faithfulness and truth, who keeps faithfulness for thousands, who forgives wrongdoings, violation of his law and sin, yet he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished, inflicting the punishment of the fathers on the children and on the grandchildren to the third and the fourth generations. Now, the last part was pretty harsh thing to say, but that is very much true when it comes to God. But we see here throughout all the scriptures here that the scriptures proclaim that God is indeed faithful and he himself, he attests to the fact that he is faithful. But the real question that we might have here is, is that what is it to be faithful or, you know, to have faithfulness, right? Well, to be faithful, all it really means is just to remain loyal or remaining loyal and steadfast. And let's break down, let's break this down a little bit better so we can still understand faithful even more so, right? So what is it to be loyal? To be loyal is to give or show firm and constant support or allegiance to a person or institution. Think about sports fans. You know, some of us, especially basketball fans, like we have sports teams that we follow that are complete and utter garbage. Like, I mean, back in the day, they used to be the stuff, right? They used to win championships. They used to go to the NBA finals, all these different things. But then now, like they're at the bottom of the East or the West when it comes to basketball or in other sports that you're playing, they're at the bottom at the leaderboards pretty much. But then still you as a fan, you're still showing them firm and constant support and allegiance to that institution, in this case being the sports team, because you're a loyal fan. And despite everything that you've gone through, the highs, and you might be in a low right now, you might be in a middle area, you might be going back to a high, you're still loyal, you're still supporting that team in which you're just like, I love this team. I want to be with this team. I'm going to be loyal to this team. So you're still showing that firm and constant support or allegiance to them. You're being, by all means, faithful to them, right? But the other part of faithfulness is not only loyalty, so remaining loyal, but also steadfastness or being steadfast. And all it is to be steadfast really just means to be firm or unwavering in a specific thing, whether it be like to a person or to an idea or whatever it may be is just the core part of steadfastness is being firm and unwavering. So when we think about somebody being faithful, we think about somebody who's showing firm and constant support or allegiance. In this case, let's say if it's to a person, so to a person, right? And this to a person. And on the other hand, it's just this person is also going to be firm and unwavering in regards to how they feel or what they think about this particular person, and how they're going to interact with them. Right. So God is faithful. And we're going to talk about a lot of different things in which he's faithful towards too, as well as we continue to go through this message. Now, I want to give you two words actually in the Greek and the Hebrew to for faithfulness, faithfulness, because I want you to understand faithfulness a little bit better and to kind of expand your mind upon like how you view faithfulness, because it's pretty simple so far. Like, OK, somebody that's loyal and steadfast or steadfast in their loyalty but there's a little bit more that goes behind faithfulness right and i think it's good to paint this bit of a bigger picture as we're talking about the faithfulness of god so the greek word for faithful for faithful is pistos and the definition of this word because it's translated as faithful is faithful right but another definition for this word is reliable 
And so what this should tell us really, and especially anytime that you get into the Greek and the Hebrew, is that when it comes to God being faithful in this idea of faithfulness, there's also this idea of reliability. And when somebody's reliable, that means that they're trustworthy or you can like pretty much you can rely on them. Right. Like no matter what, through thick and thin, they'll have your back and they can be, you know, a good person to trust with certain tasks, amongst other things. But in the way that this word is used, sometimes it's usage. It can actually also um, mean more like trustworthy, faithful still as well and believing. So there's also this another aspect that comes to faithfulness or being faithful that comes with trustworthiness. But there's another part that comes with believing. I think this is very interesting because the last time or before in the beginning of the series when we spoke about the love of God and I was breaking down the definition of love, you know, the last part of love, it tells us this is so like love believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things and bears all things. That's like the last part of the definition of love. And it's a firm reason or it's because of this that I firmly believe that God actually believes in us, right? And so here as well, we see with the usage of this word pistols, which is translated as faithful, there's this aspect of believing added on to it. And I just want you to keep that in mind as we continue to go through the sermon. Now, one Hebrew word that's used for faithful is immuna, right? And this word, it means firmness, which we already kind of broken down. Firmness is kind of just means like being rooted and steadfastness, again, just meaning being firm and unwavering. And another word as well is fidelity. And fidelity, by all means, I would say, is a synonym for faithfulness. So there's this aspect of faithfulness that's just not just loyalty or steadfastness, but also just this firmness, this trustworthiness and reliability, but also a little bit of things that have to result in believing in somebody. Because part of the reason for why you're faithful to somebody, I would say, is because you believe in them. I think God earnestly believe, believes in us too and believes in a lot of things, right? And so with us, this aspect of him being faithful to us partly because he believes in us, amongst other things. Just like how a sports fan, they may be loyal, they may be faithful to their team, like Knicks fans are faithful to their team and they believe in them that one day they can go back to the NBA Finals and win it all again. So there's this aspect of faithfulness. It's not just being, that means not just being loyal or steadfast, but it's also this aspect that involves trustworthiness, reliability, and a little bit of faith, as in the name of the word, faithfulness. But let's go into the scriptures for a second and actually get some examples of God's faithfulness that's found within the scriptures, right? I have two really big but important examples of God's faithfulness that we can find within the scriptures. The first of which is with Israel, right? God is faithful to Israel despite their sin, and the rejection of the Messiah. Now, whenever we talk about Israel, one thing we should understand is that like, we're not dissimilar to Israel. Like we harp on them, we get on them for how bad they treated God, but we treat him the same way amongst other things, even as Christians. And we definitely did before we came to Christ. So, you know, we got to humble ourselves for a second because we got to realize that we're hypocrites in the way that we're speaking about this. But at the same time, like Israel did God bad amongst other things. They were in covenant. They were in relationship with one another. They were God's chosen people, but then yet they were described as adulterous, stiff-necked. They didn't listen to God's commandments. They constantly turned away from him and went towards idols, especially like during the book of Judges. If you ever read the book of Judges, you can see how many times that God has restored Israel. And then they turn away from him going to worship other gods like Astaroth and Baal and things like that and turning towards the things of the world rather than following through with God's, God and his commandments, specifically during that time being the law of Moses. And furthermore, when God is like coming to save them from their sin, from their unrighteousness and from their holiness, and Jesus Christ comes into the world, world, you know, born of a virgin, they reject him. They don't even take him as their Messiah, but instead they crucify him. And the interesting part, part about this is that when it comes to spreading the gospel, like the gospel came first to the Jews who were meant to spread it to the rest of the world. So it came first to the Jews and then later came to the Gentiles afterwards. So they were meant to be the first receivers of the gospel message, right? But they still rejected their Messiah. And you just see this entire idea all throughout the scriptures, like from Exodus to Revelation, you see this gigantic idea of the Israelites, the Jews, the Hebrews constantly rejecting God, but him still being faithful towards them, restoring them, bringing them back to him, and so on and so forth. Like some really good examples that we can think of in the scriptures is like how they complained and they wanted to go back to Egypt in the wilderness when Moses was delivering them and God was using Moses to deliver them out of Egypt into the promised land. And it's just like, oh my goodness, God, why'd you bring us into the wilderness? We're starving and you're hungry. And he's already done so many different things for them by, by then. He freed them from slavery. He's been feeding them, but they're still complaining and stuff like that. We want water. It'd be better for us to, you know, you just brought us out here to die and it'd be better for us to go back to Egypt. 
right? But he was still faithful to them. And actually, at one point, he even got so angry with them that he said, I'm not going to personally go up with you to the promised land. I'm just going to send the angel ahead of you to deliver you and bring you into the promised land, but I'm not going to go. But through the intercession of Moses, that changed a little bit. And then we go a little bit more further in time in regards to Israel is that they have again broken the covenant that God has made with them. And so the curses that God promised to come upon them because they broke the covenant are coming upon them. And so they're taken up into slavery into Babylon, which eventually turns into Persia and a few other places. And so we read about this a little bit in Jeremiah three, but like God, the relationship between Israel and God is described in a lot of different ways. One way is between a father and a son, but another way is literally between a husband and a wife. And so with this, God literally says, he talks about this in Jeremiah 3. He's like, Israel, you're faithless. But he's like, but I'm faithful to you. And they actually got divorced at one point. But even though they were divorced, he took back basically his wife being Israel because God is faithful to Israel despite their sin and the rejection of their Messiah who is supposed to give them salvation. Now, we as the Gentiles, we're still able to benefit, which is fantastic. But he came first to the Jews and then to the Gentiles second. And the Bible talks about this. But... The gospel coming to the Gentiles was a way to provoke Israel to jealousy that they may come back to the Lord God and serve him once again. But this is what the Bible actually says in Romans 11, 25 through 27. And this really tells us about the faithfulness of God, despite all the things in which Israel has done to God, turning away to idolatry, rejecting God. They've also rejected him as king and many other things. If you read about that in 1 Samuel, this is what it says. For I do not want you, brothers and sisters, to be uninformed of this mystery so that you will not be wise in your own estimation, that a partial hardening has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And so all of Israel will be saved just as it is written. The deliverer will come from Zion. He will remove ungodliness from Jacob. This is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. And so some people think that this actually references Revelation with 144,000 because each person or there's... um. There's a representative from the 12 tribes and 144,000, 12,000 people from each tribe there. And that's what God's talking about here when he's saying that all of Israel is going to be saved. He's going to deliver. He's going to deliver them because they're going to be saved through the tribulation. God's name is going to be written on their foreheads. They're going to be delivered and saved from tribulation. They're going to have a special tongue onto themselves. But when it says here, the deliverer will come from Zion. He will remove ungodliness from Jacob. This is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. Some people think that's in reference to that. But generally, this is good idea here. In Romans 11, that Paul paints that even in spite of everything that Israel has done, God is still faithful to Israel and he's promising that he's going to save him. So indeed, he is going to save all of Israel, not just some of Israel, but all of Israel. Now, that's of course, this is nuance to this, of course, but there's just this idea that indeed he's going to save all of them. So one really big example of God's faithfulness, right, is his faithfulness towards Israel, despite their sin and the rejection of the Messiah being the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, another big example of God's faithfulness that we see within the scriptures is with Abraham, right? God is faithful to the covenant that he makes with Abraham, who is absolutely the forefather of our faith. Genesis 12, 1 through 3 tells us this. Now, the Lord said to Abram, go from your country and from your relatives and from your father's house to the land, which I will show you, and I'll make you into a great nation and I'll bless you and make your name great. And you shall be a blessing and I'll bless those who bless you and the one who curses you, I will curse and in you all the families of the earth will be blessed, right? So God, he makes this covenant with Abraham. He says, go from your country. He's from Babylon, right? And from your relatives and from your father's house, he's going to bring you to a land, which I'll show you, which is the land of Canaan, which is the promised land. And he says, I'm going to make you into a great nation. I'm going to bless you. I'm going to make your name great. You're, you're going to be a blessing. I'm going to bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you. He's like, and in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. And by all means, God is absolutely faithful to this covenant that he made with Abraham because we actually see a lot of it fulfilled within our lifetimes or now that we're past a lot of different things that happened in history. So let's break it down for a second. So the first part where he says, I will make you a great nation in verse two in Genesis 12 two. He indeed has made Abraham into a great nation. And what he really means by this is that Abraham is gonna have a whole lot of descendants in which he does. Because first, Abraham has Ishmael with Hagar. And from Ishmael, some Muslims claim that from Ishmael literally comes like a lot of different Muslims, Arab Muslims. But at the very least, Ishmael, he had 12 sons. And from them come the Arabs, right? Which is a group of people. And that's a really large group of people. So indeed, that's a part of God fulfilling this covenant that he's making with Abraham. But as well, from Abraham came Isaac. And from Isaac came Jacob and Esau. Right. And so Jacob is Israel. Esau is Edom. And here we have two really great nations right now. Edom and Israel oftentimes at war with one another because Jacob and 
Esau, amongst other things, had beef, but it's okay. And so Israel, as we know it, did become a great nation, right? But also Edom, Esau, right? They also became a great nation. So this idea here for Abraham, right? This idea with God that he's just like, I'm going to make you into a great nation. God was absolutely faithful to what he said. And he fulfilled this, he fulfilled this a whole ton when we actually begin to look at history and we begin to look at the scriptures, right? Because it's from Abraham came the Arabs, it's, became, it's from Abraham that came the Jews, the Hebrews, the Israelites, right? And also those who belong to the Edomites or belong to Esau, right? And so it's from Abraham that a lot of different people were descended from, a lot of people, different people came from, right? And so God is being faithful to this covenant that he makes here with Abraham. Another part of this that he says, he says, and I will bless you and I will make, you, make your name great. And indeed, Abraham's name, as a matter of fact, is great. Abraham is like infamous, or really I should say he's famous because infamous is usually in like a bad connotation. And literally for us, for um, people that are Christians, for people that are Muslims and for people that are Jews, like the three, they're called the three Abrahamic faiths, right? He literally has three whole religions named after him because he is by all means the forefathers uh, the forefather of all those things between like him giving birth to ishmael which apparently leads to islam you know him eventually being the grandfather of israel or jacob which leads to judaism and then also from judaism spouts christianity he is famous in that regard he's regarded as like the forefather of faith the father of faith abraham whom at first he was the first one who was justified by his faith because the bible says that he believed god and is credited to him as righteousness and now we believe god and is credited to us as righteousness and we're justified by our faith just like abraham was justified by his faith he is absolutely famous and his reputation is absolutely insane even to this day so god was completely faithful when he said that he's going to make abraham's name great as well says you shall be a blessing and i'll bless those who bless you and we see that throughout the scriptures and the one who curses you i'll curse and in you all the families of the earth will be blessed and that's true in him all the families of the earth are blessed because it's from the seed of abraham that comes the lord jesus christ and so because Christ has come, he's died on the cross for remission of our sins, and whoever believes in him will not perish but receive eternal life. The way of salvation has been made known, and now we can be reconciled for God or to God, at least those of us who believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And so all the families of the earth are blessed by this because now we can repair the fractured relationship that we had with God. And now as well, we can get back in relationship with him. We can begin to walk in the will of God once again. And that all starts with Abraham and God being faithful to the covenant that he makes with Abraham and saying to him, in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. So two big examples of the faithfulness of God that we see within the scriptures is God's faithfulness to Israel, right? Despite their sin and their rejection of the Messiah being the Lord Jesus Christ, but also God's being faithful to the covenant that he makes with Abraham. Now, the thing is about somebody being faithful or the faithfulness is that when you're faithful to somebody or when you're a faithful person, you have to be faithful to somebody or something. And I want to break down. I want to give you four important things that God is faithful to. And these things apply to us and they're important for us to know. And these are like the big things in which we, when we're saying God is faithful, this is what he's being faithful to amongst other things. And the first of these things is his character, right? So God is faithful to his character. This is what the Bible says in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 13. It tells us this, if we are faithless, he remains faithful, true to his word and his righteous character, for he cannot deny himself. And this is what it says in the amplified translation of the Bible. So God is faithful to his character. And that's very important for us to know because it helps us understand that God is trustworthy. He's reliable. But why is that the case? Because if God is faithful to his character, guess what? That means that he's never going to change right? God doesn't change because absolutely he is perfect and he is mature. He's complete. There's nothing that needs to be added. There's nothing that needs to be taken away. But also God doesn't change simply because he's faithful to who he is. He's faithful to his character. So when we go through the various characteristics of God and we talk about God being loving, being gracious, him being merciful, him being righteous, him being just, him being holy, he's going to always be faithful. He's going to be loyal to his character and to who he is. And so with this, this means that he's never going to change. And because God never changes, that means that he is trustworthy and also reliable. As the thing is, is that for us as human beings, the reason for why we don't trust people sometimes or we don't think that they're reliable is because they change too much, right? They have all these masks that they put on. And so when they get, when they get into certain situations with us, all of a sudden they take that mask off and they're like, this is who I really am. 
and they're not faithful to the character in which they present to you. But guess what? God is faithful to the character that he presents to you. And some of us, I'm going to be honest with you, we don't think that God is actually faithful to his character. We think that God is loving and gracious and merciful, but eventually one day he's just going to take off his mask and say, ha ha, really, I'm, I was never loving to begin with, or I was never gracious, I was never merciful. And the funny thing is that we always think that God is always faithful to him, to his wrath, to his justice, but never to his other attributes that are much more beneficial to us amongst other things, right? But God is faithful specifically to his character. And so because he is faithful to his character, we can trust him because we know that he'll never change. And because we're beginning to learn his character and we know his character and we know that his character is never going to change, we can know the things that he will do or would do, I should say, and we can know the things that he would not do amongst other things, right? So the first area, the first thing that God is faithful in and faithful to is his character, which is very important for us because it helps us to trust him and helps us to see him and understand him as being reliable, right? The second thing in which God is faithful to is his word. And when I mean his word, I do by all means mean the things, everything that he's ever spoken to you. But I also mean specifically, I'm talking about specifically here, the word of God. So the Bible, right? God is faithful to his word. And this is very important for us as Christians to know and to understand. Isaiah 55, 11, it tells us this. So will my word be, which goes out of my mouth, or so will my word be, which goes out of my mouth. It will not return to me empty without accomplishing what I desire and without succeeding in the purpose for which I sent it. And so the last part here, it says, literally, it says, it will not being the word of God return to me empty without accomplishing what I desire and without succeeding in the purpose for which I sent it. So God is faithful to his word. And you know what that means for us? If God says something in the word of God, in the Bible, right? If he says something's going to happen, then it's going to happen. If he says, if you do this and then this is going to happen, then it ind indeed is going to happen. And as Christians, we have to understand that because God is faithful to his word. And he's saying to us, because he's faithful to his word, he's saying like, if my word says something or promises something to you, or if my word says, if you do this, then this will happen, then these things it will indeed happen actually happen because God is faithful to his word. He's going to make sure that it comes true. It's going to go and accomplish what he desires and it's going to succeed in the purpose for which he sent it, right? A lot of us, we don't necessarily live lives as if God is faithful to his word because we're sitting there thinking like, man, I do all these things that the Bible says, but then nothing's happening. But let God be true and every man a liar because God is absolutely faithful to his word. The thing is, oftentimes is that there's just caveats. There's conditions on his word, right? Like, you know, you need to be obedient, or you need to be living right. Or, you know, perhaps you need to humble yourself and bring yourself low. Or you need to do something first in order for these things to happen. But even still, God is absolutely faithful to this word. And I kind of want to paint this picture and give you some examples to help you understand why this is so important and exactly powerful for us. Because this means that if God is faithful to his word, then anything that his word says, if we do as it says, it should come true and be true in our lives. I want to give you some really good and easy examples that I commonly draw from. One is um, Isaiah 26, 3, which says, those who keep their minds stayed upon the Lord and trust him, he'll keep them in perfect peace. I like to deem the Bible sometimes as like a math equation, literally X plus Y equals whatever you want. So in this case, it'd be peace. And you just have to plug in the X and the Y, and which would be this for those who keep their minds stayed upon the Lord. That's the X. So, you know, focusing on God and keeping him top of mind and those who trust in him, that'll be why then you receive perfect peace. And because God is faithful to his word, he's going to make sure that that actually appears in your life as long as you fulfill what he said first. Keep your mind stayed upon me and trust in me. and You'll keep me in perfect peace. Another example for those of you that are dealing with anxiety is a very common, easy example. Philippians 4, 6 through 7 is what it says. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything with prayer and supplication and thanksgiving to make your requests made known to God. Then the peace that's beyond all understanding may encompass your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So it gives us like the first thing that we need to do. So instead of worrying and being anxious and stressing over things, instead, the Bible says, be anxious for nothing, but do this instead. But in everything with prayer, so asking God, supplication, which means humbly asking and thanksgiving. So praising and worshiping and being thankful unto God, you know, give God your request, make your request made known to God. So petition him. Then 
after you do these things, the pieces beyond all understanding may encompass your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. As well, the rule, the golden rules of prayer and everything. Jesus says, ask you shall receive, seek you shall find, knock and the door will be open for you. And he encourages us as well to continue to ask. He says, keep seeking, keep, at, or keep asking, keep seeking, and keep knocking. But first you need to ask, first you need to seek, right? And first you need to knock, then things will begin to happen. And the thing is, is that this the reason for why this is so important and great for us as Christians is because God is, as a matter of fact, faithful to his word. So if his word says it, then it should and it will happen in your life as long as you follow what it actually says and you be obedient to it. Another example, a big one when it comes to temptation out of 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, it tells us this. It says, no temptation that's overtaking you is uncommon to man. And it says, but God is faithful that he will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you can endure. He says, but with the temptation, you'll be you'll receive the way of escape also that you may be able to endure it. Right. So God, he's saying here in this word, he's like, OK, first off, no temptation that you're dealing with is uncommon to man, as in there's other people that dealt with it. So you don't feel by yourself and by alone. He says, on top of that, I'm not going to allow you to be tempted beyond what you're going or what you can endure. So he's like, I'm going to compensate, you know, if it's too much for you, I'm going to take care of that so that you can be able to deal with it. Right. And he says, furthermore, there's always going to be a way out out of this temptation where I'm always going to give you a way out. You just simply need to endure it. And so because God is faithful to his word, every single time that we go into temptation, we should have 1 Corinthians 10, 13, like playing in our mind. And we should trust and believe that God is true. Why? Because God is faithful. And he's going to remain loyal and steadfast in regards to his word. And that if his word says something, then we should believe that it's going to come true. Right? So one area, a very important area, another important area that God is faithful to is his word. And so for us as Christians, because God is faithful to his word, we should believe and obey the word of God and be submissive to it. And expect these things to earnestly happen within our lives. Because some of us were sitting there thinking just like, man, God, why are none of these things happening in my life? Right? It's because you're not being faithful. You're not holding up your end of the deal. God is going to always be faithful to his word. But are you going to be faithful to him? Are you going to be obedient and do the things in which he asks of you on your side of things so that he can begin to work in your life like his word says, amongst other things? So first, God is faithful to his character. But second, God as well, he's faithful to his word. Another area in which God is faith, faithful to is his people, right? So us, by all means. Deuteronomy 7, 9 tells us this. Know therefore that the Lord your God, he is God, the faithful God, who keeps his covenant and his faithfulness to a thousand generations for those who love him and keep his commandments. So God is faithful to his people. What does that mean? What does it mean that God is faithful to me? It means that he's never going to leave or forsake or abandon you. Some of us think that the moment that we sin... The moment that we turn away from God or we backslidden and we've gone and done God knows what, amongst other things, that all of a sudden God is going to abandon us and turn us over to Satan completely and totally. Like, yeah, you, you might go through some stuff, but God's not going to abandon you. He's still going to convict you of sin and unrighteousness. He's still going to pursue you and bring you back to his son. He's still going to lo love on you. And he's still going to be like, you're my child. I want you to be back with me. Right? So with God being faithful to his people, this is this here is actually telling us that God is always going to take care of you. God is always going to seek after you. God is never going to forsake or abandon you in any capacity. But he's always going to be like, you are my people. So I'm going to be faithful to you, just like with Israel, because with Israel, even if he rejected them for a time, guess what? He always brought them back. And it's the same thing with you. A lot of us, we, we got to really understand that God is faithful to his people because we're scared all the time. If I don't live perfectly. If I don't do this, if I don't do that, then all of a sudden God's just going to turn his face away from me completely and totally I'm going straight to hell. But no, that's not even what the Bible teaches us about God. It teaches us about him being faithful. And if he's faithful to an adulterous Israel, he can be faithful to you who struggle sometimes. Or he can be faithful to, to you whom that person that's sitting there just like, I'm trying my best to serve you, God. It's just so hard. I need your help. Right? Or he can be faithful to the person that's an apostate. But then eventually they repent and turn back to God. He'll be faithful to that person that's a backslider, to the lukewarm, and so many. Because some of us, we've been those things before. But guess what? God pulled us out of that. Why did God pull us out of that? Well, because he loves you, naturally, and because of his grace and his mercy. But also because he is faithful. God is faithful to his people. Which means that he's going to be in your corner. He's going to be loyal to you. He's always going to seek after you and try to bring you back to him. And that's not going to change. Why? Also, because God is faithful to his character. So first, God is faithful to his character. Second, he's faithful to his word. 
third, he's faithful to his people. But what's the last thing I have for you in regards to God being faithful? Like, what else is he faithful to? God is faithful to his promises. The Bible tells us in Numbers 23, 9, it says, God is not a man that he will lie, nor a son of man that he will change his mind. Has he said, and will he not do it? Or has he spoken, and will he not make it good? That last part, which is the important part, well, all of it is important, actually, but has he said, and will he not do it? Or has he spoken, and will he not make it good? Some of us have promises from God, and we're just thinking that God's just going to leave us hanging dry. But if he's promised you something, he's going to fulfill it. Some of you have received prophetic words, God's just spoken to you personally, or even you see some promises in the word of God, and you might not have seen these things in your life yet. But I promise you that he indeed is going to be faithful to his promises. Just be faithful to him. Because like I was speaking about before, oftentimes these things just have a caveat. Just be obedient, right? Because do not be fooled. God is not mocked. All right? Because a lot of us, we run around thinking that we can do anything that we want to do. It's just like, oh, okay, God is faithful, so he's going to take care of me. Like, yeah, he is faithful, but he's going to make you repent first before we kind of get through these things. Be obedient. But God is faithful to his promises. For some of us, God has promised us perhaps a husband or a wife, a spouse. For some of us, God has promised us deliverance or inner healing, right? We have some trauma or some things that we've gone through or deliverance from mental illness. Or in other cases, God has prom promised us like getting us through something financially that we've been struggling through or taking care of things for us in our life or even the salvation of our family members are unsaved. God has promised certain things for us. All you need to do is just do what you got to do on your end. Be obedient to God. And he's going to take care of the rest. Why? Because God is faithful to his promises. If he promises something, if he says something, will he not do it? If he's spoken something, will he not make it good? Yes, absolutely. Because God is faithful. And he's faithful to the promises that he gives to his people, whether it be personally, whether it be in his word or whatever it might be. Right. Psalms 145, 13 in the NIV translation says this, it says, your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and your dominion endures through all generations. The Lord is trustworthy in all he promises. So that's the first part. The Lord is trustworthy in all he promises. You can trust him in regards to a promise, right? And faithful in all that he does. So he's faithful in all that he does. He's loyal. He's steadfast. He's unwavering. He's firm in all that he does, right? So for those of us that are sitting here just thinking like, man, is God ever going to fulfill this promise that he asked for me? Yes. First off, I want to encourage you, be obedient. But also just know that God, as a matter of fact, is faithful to his promises. I just told you about Abraham. That was a promise. Yes, it was a covenant. They had an agreement. It was a contract, but it was also a promise. And we've seen it throughout the scriptures and even our lives now. We're benefiting from the front promise and God being faithful to the promise that he made to Abraham. And if he's kept that, that's a really big promise. I'm pretty sure that he can keep all the beautiful and amazing promises that he's made you to. So God is faithful to his promises. So there's four main and big areas that God is faithful to in places that we should expect God to be faithful in, right? One is his character. Two is his word. Three is his people. And four is his promises. And this is important for us to know because so many of us live lives as if God is not faithful. And we're thinking that God's just going to switch it up on us all of a sudden. Like all of a sudden he's loving and then he's not going to be loving at some other time because we did something. Or all of a sudden he's going to extend grace and the grace is going to stop flowing. Or all of a sudden he's going to extend mercy and all of a sudden he's not going to be merciful anymore because we think that he's going to, he's so flippant like human beings, but he's not. He's faithful to his character first and foremost, which means that he doesn't change. And also means he's trustworthy because we know how he's always going to act because he's true to who he is. Now, the real question that we should have in regards to the faithfulness of God and learning of these different areas in which God is faithful is, is that what should I do with this information? What should I do with the faithfulness of God, the knowledge of the faithfulness of God? Well, in wisdom and applying this knowledge properly, what you should do is that you should believe God is faithful and you should hold on to that dearly and live a life as if God is faithful to you because he is. God, as a matter of fact, is faithful to his character. Believe that he's faithful to his character. Believe that he's faithful to his word. Believe that he's faithful to his people. Believe that he's faithful to his promises. Because God is faithful, understand that he's unchanging. He's trustworthy. You can trust him. 1 Corinthians 8, 9 tells us God is faithful through whom you are called into fellowship with his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Believe that he is faithful. Because when you do, I promise a lot of you or all of you, your lives are going to change. You're going to start to view life differently. You're going to start to live life differently once you understand and believe and accept the fact that God is faithful. That yes, he's faithful to who he is, which means that he's never going to change. Yes, he's faithful to his word. So that means that if I do what his word says, I should expect these things in my life. 
Yes, he's faithful to his people, which means he's never going to forsake or abandon me. And he's faithful to his promises, as in if he says something to me or somebody prophesied over me as earnestly from God that I can expect these things to be fulfilled. All I got to do is to say, OK, God, I'm just do whatever you need me to do for this to happen. We have to believe that God is faithful and we have to hold on to this characteristic dearly. We do because it's so, 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 so important. Before in the series, I was talking about how all of God's characteristics permeate within or throughout one another. And it's the same with his faithfulness because he's faithfulness or because he's faithful. He's always going to be loving. He's always going to be gracious. He's always going to be merciful. He's always going to be holy. He's always going to be just. He's always going to be righteous in all the various characteristics of God. And that is because he is faithful. It means he's unchanging, which helps us to understand, too, that he's trustworthy. And the beautiful thing about this is that this is a blessing for all of humanity. Although for some of us, we may not like it, though, because then that means that we can't change God or mold God to what we want him to be. Because with God being faithful, like it's beautiful and amazing that he's faithful to being loving, gracious and merciful. But for some of us, it might not be so nice that he's so faithful to being just and he's faithful to his own wrath and he's faithful to his holiness and his righteousness. Because that means that our lives have to change. But it's OK. God's way really is Yah's way or no way. Right. God's way is better than yours. Stop playing around. Right. But understand that God is faithful. And with understanding this, what should you do with it? Live a life as if he is. Believe and walk out in faith, literally, that God is faithful and hold on to that dearly and watch how your life changes. For me personally, in my life, I would say me being sanctified and made holy as the Lord is holy, me changing about so many di different things, me learning so many things about the word of God and walking in the calling which God has for me, a part of it was me functionally understanding that God is faithful, but specifically to his word. And so as I began to read the word of God and pray the word of God over my life, which also tells us that if we pray anything according to his will, will we have a confidence that he hears us. So as I began to do any, doing these things, I found that like these things are earnest, honest to God, true, because God is faithful to his word. And I began to be transformed by the renewing of a mind because I stopped conforming to the world and being transformed by the renewing of my mind. I started being less anxious not being nearly as fearful and so many different things because I understood, I believed, yes, God is faithful and I held on to that dearly. And I said, if God is faithful, then that means that if his word says it, all I need to do is be obedient to his word and it's going to appear in my life at one point or another. And he's never proven me wrong, amongst other things. And that's something for a lot of us we got to do. It may not necessarily be with his word, but we just need to hold on to the fact that he's faithful to his character, the fact that he loves you or that he's going to extend grace to you or mercy to you, right? Or in other cases that he's holy, that he's righteous and that you can't keep living the way that you're living. It has to change. You can't change the Bible. You can't change him or the fact that he's faithful to his people. Some of us think that God is going to abandon us like other people have abandoned us, but he's not because he's faithful. He's loyal, right? So he's going to keep close to you. He's always going to take care of you and seek after you. Some of you have experienced, especially if you have lived in backslidden or lukewarm lives, how much God just continues to try to minister to you and bring you back to him because you keep meeting people. You keep seeing videos. You know, sometimes you might open up the word of God. and It's just something that strikes you right at the core. And also for some of us, we have to believe that God is faithful to his promise. It may not look like things are happening or that something's going to change or Things are going to be different, but I tell you that God's timing is perfect. Just be obedient, do as he says, and absolutely, because he is faithful, what he says will come true. But that's everything I have in regards to the faithfulness of God. I hope that you're earnestly built up and edified by this message. We're going to head over into announcements and then into the final prayer and benediction. I'll see you guys in a second.